So it's my absolute pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Professor Olgita Milenkovic of uh, Urbana-Champaign, where she's a professor of electrical and computer engineering, and also a research professor at the coordinated science laboratory. Uh, she obtained her master's <coughs> in mathematics and her PhD in electrical engineering, as you just heard um, from the uh, <laughs> University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and she heads a, um, a highly multidisciplinary group uh, that um, works on and um, sort of integrates and combines elements from um, very challenging areas of algorithm design and computing, mathematics, coding theory, machine learning, and signal processing. And she has um, way too many awards uh, for me to go through. No. If you want to leave her time <laughs> to speak. Um, among them, she was a recent, uh, and she was recently, um, she became a fellow of the IEEE Information Theory Society, and she was also recently a distinguished lecturer in the society. And she was associate or editor in chief of many, many, um, in all of these areas that I mentioned. So it was um, a really pleasure uh, to be able to hear from her. Today we're going to talk, we're going to hear about stringer construction problems in molecular storage. So thanks a lot for the kind introduction, Saki. And as you can tell, the title morphed into something slightly different than what you saw in the announcement. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here and see a lot of familiar coding theory faces in the audience and information theorists alike. So since it's a, a smaller group of us, I would really like to have a dialogue with you guys. So if you wanna, uh, if you wanna see if to slow down with some explanations or move faster, I'm pretty flexible. And what I want to discuss is going to be mostly theoretical in nature, but uh, offline we can discuss more practical applications behind uh, all of these problems that I'm going to uh, discuss. And the idea is that uh, nowadays we are getting quite excited about uh, this notion of molecular storage, using uh, molecules to store information. And uh, based on the choice of molecules we use, we are going to run into different uh, questions regarding the construction of the stored information. And I will discuss three topics today related to string reconstruction that arise naturally in a certain way in molecular storage. So let's first start with, uh, for those of you that may never have seen much of a biology, uh, uh, back or may not have a biology background and may not have seen um, a lot about gen genomics and proteomics, all you need to know for this talk is on this slide. All the biology I'm going to squeeze on one slide, and this slide tells you something that is known as the central dogma of genetics. Now we know it's not really a dogma because uh, some uh, dogma is an undisputed truth that, can, uh, that is never in question. We know that the central dogma is not quite true, but for this talk, all you have to care about is this uh, three entities here. This uh, first entity is DNA, or a double helix um, a string over a four-letter alphabet that uh, contains all the information that is basically needed for uh, functioning, proper functioning of a cell. And this information is stored in, the, in this double helix in the following way. You have two strands, three prime, five prime, and five prime, three prime strands, which are so-called sugar phosphate backbones. And from the sugar phosphate backbones, you have uh, protruding uh, bases. These four letter symbols, ATCGs, are bases, and they're paired up in a deterministic way. For some reason, the pointer doesn't work. It looks like weird on this way. It, oh, okay, sure. So I'll show you with my finger. So uh, the Watson tree complementarity rule says that an A is paired up with a T and a G is paired up with a C. So the information bearing con uh, strand here is either one of these two. The other one is just uh, uh, preserving the integrity of a strand and it allows you to do quick replication uh, when the cell divides. This genetic material is uh, transcribed or read into a template which is a single-stranded molecule called messenger RNA. 
And think of this as the master copy of the genetic content that usually sits in the nucleus of a cell. And the transcripts are the ones that are allowed to carry the message of the uh, master copy outside of the cell nucleus. And the only difference between uh, DNA and, and uh, messenger RNA is that a T symbol becomes a U symbol. Basically, uh, uracil is uh, what's replacing uh, 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 T. And this string itself is in the central dogma, uh, based on the central dogma, translated uh, into polypeptide chains. Or basically, think of these as uh, proteins. And uh, each protein consists of a bunch of polypeptide chains. And the alphabet size is 20, because we have 20 building blocks for these chains. Um, these are called amino acids. So, the central dogma really tells you how information flows from the master copy DNA to uh, the level of the messengers, which are the RNA molecules, to the level of the structural units that we call proteins or polypeptide chains. So since these two, three entities are extremely relevant for everything that the cell does and the cell uh, 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 functionally performs, it's very important to be able to read the content of these sequences. And this has been a, a topic of great interest in medical science and in other areas for decades now. So when it comes to sequencing methods, DNA is sequenced uh, nowadays in two standard ways. One uh, way uh, is known as shotgun sequencing, and you can think of it as part of this new uh, next generation sequencing platforms. And the idea is that with shotgun sequencing, you take a genetic sequence, let's say a DNA sequence, you create a large number of copies of the same sequence, and then you shred it into fragments. And this shredding gives you pieces that maybe overlapped prefix to suffix, suffix with each other. So for example, this piece and this piece overlap because the suffix of this piece overlaps with the prefix of this other piece. And since you have multiple copies of the same uh, string, once you shred it, you will be able, hopefully, to find a prefix and a suffix overlaps that allow you to reconstruct the original sequence. So most of these next generation sequencing methods that use uh, shredding of the sequences operate in a similar manner. The third generation sequencing platforms that are starting to get, gain a lot of uh, attention are so-called nanopore sequencing systems. There are other systems, but they have a uh, disappeared a little bit from the literature, like PacBio and other uh, uh, single-strand sequencing devices or single-molecule sequencing devices. So let's just focus on nanopore sequencers. So what are nanopores? Nanopores, think of the uh, nanopores as holes or um, uh, proteins in, uh, embedded on a membrane. The pore itself, in most of these uh, sequencing devices, is a protein itself, which is uh, some a specific shape. It looks like a hole, in this case, a hole through which a molecule can pass. And on top of it, uh, uh, you have something that has to unzip the DNA when the molecule passes through the hole or to the pore in, embedded on the membrane. And since in the absence of any, since in the absence of any molecules passing through the uh, pore, there will be an ion flow through the pore when a DNA molecule starts passing through it, the ion current will be stopped, it will be blocked, and you will see a dip in the, uh, at, the uh, at the level of the current. So based on which of the four symbols ATGC is passing through the hole, you will see different levels of drop, which are caused by the, uh, by the fact that all these four symbols, ATGC, have different charges. So based on the charge of the molecule, you will see a different drop in the ion current, and that's what allows us to detect what the content of the DNA sequence was. So in addition to these biological pores, we now have a large interest in uh, solid state nanopores where the uh, hole or the pore itself is not a protein or a, a native entity, but something that is uh, made either of uh, uh, silicon nitride or a molybdenum disulfide, so those have different properties, but they operate in a very similar way. 
So um, as I mentioned, the shotgun sequencing technique is used quite a lot and it has the good property that it gives you low error rates for the readout, while nanopore sequencing allows us to read much longer lengths. So the fragments we can uh, push through a nanopore can be of length uh, 15,000 and even longer, uh, but they have usually higher error rates. So how do we read proteins? So you saw how we uh, can detect uh, the content of DNA strands and RNA can be detected in pretty much the same way. But how do we read the content of protein sequences? So this is something where the method of choice is slightly different. It's called mass spectrometry. There are some proposals to use nanopores for protein sequencing, but it's much less common. And the idea for um, uh, behind mass spectrometry or in tandem mass spectrometry is as follows. Again, you take a set of proteins, and again, you do digestion, or you break the proteins into chains of uh, or shorter length chains, uh, chains that are called peptides. But what is interesting now is uh, once you have these shorter length peptides, you break them into pieces uh, through a process which is called fragmentation by collision. But the fragmentation is very controlled in so far that you, you can always break the uh, peptide chain at specific locations. And what you get as the output is the mass of the prefix and the mass of the suffix. So for example, if I break the chain in this position, I'll get a fragment which corresponds to this part of the molecule and another fragment which corresponds to this part of the molecule and I can read out the mass of this entity and the mass of this entity. And I can do this regularly at any location that involves a, a, a CO and H group like this. And then I get all the prefix and suffix masses and I can decide to break the chain at different locations and every time I decide for a specific location to be the break point, I get what is called an ion series. So this Y, Bs are ion series, these A's are ion series. And the usual readout that you get is the masses of the prefixes and the suffixes in the so-called MS-MS spectrum. So think of this as telling you the mass of one fragment, mass of another fragment, and so on. And the this looks very clean because it's just an illustration of how ideally mass spectrometry should work. But these cuts that I'm showing here are never that clean. When you do ionization or when you do collision, a bunch of these atoms will fall off. So the masses are not squeaky clean values of your uh, prefix and suffix ma uh, masses and you get a lot of noise. So your typical mass spectra will have a lot of noise and what we call the peaks will be buried in there and the peaks represent the true masses that you're uh, trying to find. So uh, basically mass spectrometry, I'll explain how it works. And uh, the questions that people have been asking for a long, long time, and people here at Stanford have worked on, the, on those questions as well, is, okay, if we only have access to either the substrings of a sequence, which we need to overlap suffix to prefix, or masses of prefixes and suffixes, uh, corrupted by a large uh, level noise, how do we really reconstruct the sequences? And the fundamental questions have been really addressed in the literature way back, maybe 20 years and uh, more ago, because that's when the sequencing uh, techniques really started to take off. And when it comes to DNA shotgun sequencing and string reconstruction, the important mathematical question to ask is, when is a string and everything I'll do today from this point on will be binary because all the results will carry over with some little changes for the non-binary cases. And binary cases are usually the most difficult ones to handle. So I'm going to ask these questions of binary strings and the fundamental question in shotgun sequencing is, assume that you have a string, binary string of length, uh, n, and you want to know when is the string uniquely reconstructable from the set of its substrings of length L or a multi-set of its substrings of L, length L. Uh, and these we call the L profile or L type of uh, the vector. And this is an obvious question that arises in the domain of shotgun sequencing for the simple reason that what we really get when we do shotgun sequences is obtain the readouts uh, for the different substrings. And substrings think of consecutive positions uh, uh, or elements in the string. And uh, if 
I know that my sequencing technology will produce substrings of length L, I would really like to know, can I uniquely reconstruct the string only based on information about these pieces of length L? So these, these, these are called the substring spectra. The next question we want to, uh, or an example that illustrates that this is not that obvious and uh, not always possible is uh, an example that involves two strings, X and Y. And if I look at the three spectra of these, three, of these two different strings, I will see that all, uh, both strings have the same L is equal to three spectrum. Uh, why? Because here is one, zero, zero, here is one, zero, 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 one appears here, it appears here, but in a different order. So I will get these, uh, uh, this set as a set of substrings, but it will represent both S3 of X and S3 of Y. While if I go with a slightly longer length, I go with length four, suddenly these two strings become distinguishable because the length four substrings are different. So this is uh, the first question we want to address. How do we make uh, strings uniquely reconstructable and what uh, property do these strings have to have in order to be uniquely reconstructable? Uh, when it comes to nanopore sequencers, then uh, the question becomes different because Nanopore sequencers are devices that are known to introduce different type of errors into the string. And again, you will be seeing the same string passing through the uh, same or different nanopores multiple times. So what you actually get to observe is not just one uh, readout of the string, but multiple readouts of the string. And each of these readouts will have a certain number of deletions in them. And one question that you can ask is, when is a string uniquely reconstructable from the multi-set of all its subsequences of length k? And why subsequences? Because subsequences will uh, correspond to different readouts because they, uh, they will contain only certain positions of the sequence, so you will not have con information about consecutive symbols. Uh, this is a, a, a nice mathematical requirement we are putting in of length k because there is really no guarantee that we can get all the subsequences of length k. But this problem is very interesting. It's known as the k dac problem. I will describe it a bit later in the talk. And more, uh, for example, uh, again, we can ask the question of unique, reconstruction, uh, re unique reconstructability because I can again give you two strings, x and y, and if I look at all the substrings of length two, these two strings will have the same set of substrings of length, uh, subsequences of length two. Just remember that a subsequence of length k or subsequence of length two means that I can take, take non-consecutive positions. So one, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, and so on. So in this case, again, if I take k is equal to two, I will I'll see, I'll see that these two strings are confusable. But if I increase the length of the uh, subsequences by one, I see that these two strings are not confusable because there will be different elements in these two sets. And uh, more importantly, and much more practically relevant, is this question of when is a string uniquely reconstructable from a random subset of its subsequences? And this is related to the famous trace reconstruction problem that a lot of you have heard of, and I will discuss that again in more detail on the next slides. So um, what about proteomic string reconstruction? So I mentioned that our goal is really to look at uh, ion series, masses of prefixes and suffixes, and uh, try to assemble the, the uh, protein or determine which amino acids come in what order based on the information of the masses in the prefix and the suffix. And uh, in this case, we tried really hard to come up with a mathematically clean abstraction of the problem because those peaks that come in when you lose uh, one uh, mo uh, atom here and there during the uh, collision breaking or ion series creation process, it's a bit of a dirty formulation if you try to get really precise uh, with it. So we came up with a more elegant formulation of what you really get from uh, protein sequencing. And the question we came up with is, when is a string uniquely reconstructable from its multi-set of substring compositions? And let me explain to you what this is. So if this is a string of length three, I will be 
giving you all the substring, uh, the, all the substrings of this string, uh, for example, substring zero, substring one, substring zero, I will be giving you the substrings of length two, zero, one, one, zero, and then the substring of length three, zero, one, zero. And if I tell you that's what I'm giving you, you would ask me, where is the reconstruction problem? There is a caveat to it because mass spectrometry only allows you to determine or figure out the mass of the prefix or the suffix. So I'm not really going to give you the substrings, I'm just going to give you the masses of the substrings. And since I'm working with the binary in the binary domain here, all I'm going to tell you is the weight of the substrings. So for example, uh, 0, 1, 0, I'm going to tell you there were two zeros and a 1. And I don't know in which order they appeared. And then I will tell you there was one fragment that had a 0 and a 1, and I'm not telling you in which order they appeared. Then another fragment had uh, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Again, I'm not telling you the order in which they appeared, because this could have been 0, 1, or 1, 0. So this is what we call the uh, a collection of uh, sub, uh, or multi-set of substring compositions. And it seems like you're getting a lot of information from, from the uh, multi-sets, from these uh, descriptions of what the uh, composition of a substring is, but it's actually not enough information to reconstruct the string uniquely. And the first thing you should notice is if I take a string and I take its reversal, there's no way I can distinguish them because they will have the exact same multi-set composition. So these uh, sets will be identical. So if we ignore things up to reversal, the question is, can we really do reconstruction? Can we come up with uh, an explanation of when a, a string will be uniquely reconstructable? And all of this is based on this idea that mass may be equated with composition, nothing more. And it gives you a little bit more information uh, in, a, in so far that you're looking at all substrings, not just prefixes and suffixes, to make the problem formulation simpler for future analysis. So this is all um, exciting from a perspective of uh, those of you that were really only interested in uh, genetic and proteomic sequencing. But what, what really came up in the recent uh, past, in the last few years, is the fact that all these entities have been used as uh, recording devices for macromolecular storage. And uh, all three entities, DNA, uh, RNA, and proteins, have been used as storage entities or storage uh, media. And in addition, some uh, polymer structures have been used as uh, storage media as well. And so how does this usually work? Uh, the first idea in this area really can be attributed to George Church's group at Harvard, MIT, and uh, Goldman et al. in um, Europe at the Wellcome Trust Institute. And the schemes they both, pro both teams proposed were almost identical. So what they did is they just took user-defined content, they converted it into a four-letter alphabet, then they talked to uh, the late David McKay, who told them maybe you shouldn't use uh, uncoded data. Why don't you get rid of one symbol and just use a three-letter alphabet? I can discuss this offline. So basically, they decided to use differential coding in some form. But for the purpose of this talk, you can ignore that and think of them having used really a four-letter alphabet. And then rather than synthesizing a long message containing whatever data they were trying to store, they decided to use the trick that we already showed is used is during sequencing. They actually stored overlapping blocks of uh, uh, data snippets, overlapping suffix to prefix, in such a way that they cover each piece of information uh, four times. So, so they had fourfold redundancy. And then they just mix these uh, fourfold uh, redundant strands and they uh, sequence them as if this was a prepared library using classical uh, Illumina sequencing devices. And the, these snippets or these overlapping substrings, they didn't bother um, uh, sequence, uh, synthesizing themselves, they just used companies like IDT or Twist and other companies. And I think in uh, Goldman's case, it was Twist that synthesized these strands. And what happened is they had some issues with error correction and assembling these pieces. There were a little bit of a issue there with the holes because uh, not everything was properly synthesized. But in general, they managed to uh, reassemble the whole message 
with some holes in it back together. So when we saw this paper, and that was a long time ago, maybe uh, 14 or uh, even 13, the first question we asked as uh, information theorists is, how do they do random access in this scheme? Because the whole point was to just overlap the fragments, uh, suffix to prefix, and uh, since biologists did this work, it was really not in, on top of their mind to enable random access. If you look carefully at the paper, they had address sequences. They called them address sequences, but the address sequences were really telling you this was the first fragment, second fragment, third fragment, and God forbid if you had some errors in reading these uh, fragments, uh, you would not see the, you would not be able to get the right fragment out. So what we did is propose using specialized addresses that are resilient to error and allow, which allow you to basically fish out the strands that you want to take out by amplifying through PCR reactions only those strands that you're interested in. We also did rewritable storage, which nowadays is probably obsolete because everybody wants to use this for archival storage. And then we showed how to do coding for these uh, systems if you want to use nanopore sequencing devices, which can produce a lot of errors. And so basically coding in uh, our case was used both at the level of error correction and for en enabling random access. Another line of work that I'm very excited about and I would like to advertise is by a colleague of mine from France, Jean-Francois Lutz. So he decided to take his own path in this area and look at polymer-based synthesis. So what he can do with polymers is amazing. He can basically come up with polymers that have, uh, think of molecules, that have different masses, different charges. He can come up with a bunch of different molecules that can serve as different symbols. So in the simplest incarnation of his scheme, he came up with one type of molecule to represent a one and another type of a molecule to represent a zero. And the whole point of his scheme was to uh, uh, use different masses for one and zero in order to be able to come up with a very nice algorithm for um, reading out the data in terms of mass spectra, uh, tender mass spectrometry uh, measurements. So this is something he would get for his molecules uh, or for his polymers, you would see uh, given that he has control over the mass of the, of the individual zeros and ones, what he calls zeros and ones, uh, he would know that he starts with a given symbol, for example, and he would say, I will start with the mass fragment that has to be in a given position. And then, knowing that the next symbol is either a zero or a one, he will be looking uh, to the right to find something at the uh, mass distance uh, corresponding either to, the zero, to a zero or a one. So he would be looking for peaks at positions that either correspond to the mass of a zero or a one, starting from one location. And this seems like a very nice idea because he can easily deal with um, uh, mass spectrometry data because he knows what the masses that, uh, uh, are, what masses are used for zeros and ones and he knows where to look for the peaks. But even in this case, things become pretty complicated because you have so much noise. So what he came up with, another really uh, nice idea is to uh, organize the uh, uh, symbols into bytes and endow each byte with another molecule that will have a different mass that allows you to tell, uh, to determine which uh, position this byte is uh, located in. So for example, F will tell you it's the first position, I will tell you it's the second position. So basically, uh, uh, if you have a scheme like this, you can break off the bonds between the uh, the bytes and then try to read these symbol, uh, these bytes separately because then the mass spectra will be cleaner and easier to deal with. So it was a great pleasure working with uh, Jean-Francois's group and uh, we basically worked with him on coming up with some simple constraint coding schemes that will allow you to do this uh, uh, reconstruction based on, on mass spectrometry data and we also uh, came up with uh, his group uh, uh, up with an algorithm that allows you to do ion series fusion. So basically looking at the information from different ion series and then fusing them together. So so, so in that work, yeah. what, what were the basic units that he was synthesizing? So he would string the zeros and the ones together. So, okay, this so is the zero the, ones are what represent the information? Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. Like what were they physically? Oh, like, these are molecules. Like what? So, you know, whatever you want, uh, carbon and uh, uh, ox 
oxygen and uh, night, uh, any molecule you can think of. In his case, he has a description. I wouldn't be even able to pronounce the names of the things he used, but it's a Nature Com paper from 2016. It's just different uh, polymers that he stitched together. The only, the, the nice consideration was to make their masses as distinguishable as possible in terms of uh, readouts from the uh, mass spectrometry data that he gets and also making the break it, breaks cleaner and easier to interpret. And so it's easier a, to stitch together than So nuclei? one thing, uh, that's a very good question. It, uh, stitching these uh, uh, polymers together is much cheaper than stitching DNA together. So uh, one of his selling points is that this technology, synthesis technology, is much cheaper. And he can play with the molecules he uses to an extent that he can make this alphabet non-binary and he can make the readouts cleaner by just choosing the right molecule. Yes? What's the stability of these molecules? Oh, it, it, I don't think he has any problems oh, with that. So similar to DNA. Yeah, yeah. One thing, uh, I know this is being recorded, but the one thing that no bothers me, okay, the one thing that bothers me is it doesn't have the nice uh, properties that DNA has, the DNA double helix, because uh, if I want to do random access, I cannot use hybridization or a primer-based uh, amplification because there's no such thing here that will allow me random access and that's because this is a man-made molecule it's not a na natural molecule that you design so that it easily replicates so it's one thing that always comes out can we make this more amenable to random access and there were some solutions to that proposed by Jean-Francois's lab but I'll take that offline uh, so what string reconstruction for macromolecular storage brings on the table is actually a really interesting set of completely new coding theory questions. And uh, first, the first question that I brought up even before is when is unique string reconstruction possible under current readout systems? And that's less exciting. But more exciting for those of us that like coding theory is can coding be used to allow us to make strings uniquely reconstructable? And on top of it, if we want to even tolerant uh, to, er uh, to errors, very sequencing errors. Because you saw through a bunch of examples that uh, a lot of words are, or strings are confusable if you look at their substrings or you look at the masses of their um, substrings. But if I am uh, allowed to use coding, which I'm not allowed to do if I'm using um, just uh, natural molecules, the native DNA, if I store information, I can use coding on top of it, and maybe I can make strings uniquely reconstructable under all these um, techniques that I did, or, or readout systems that I mentioned above. So then there will be tons of really interesting new questions in coding theory that we can address in this context. And this is what I'm planning to talk about uh, throughout the rest of the talk. So what is the talk outline? It comes very late, but better never than ever. Never ever than ever. We say that a string is uniquely reconstructable from some evident set of strings, E of X, if no other string shares the evidence, the same evidence set. And you can pick what you call your evidence set based on the sequencing technology that you're interested in. And what we want to do is describe under which conditions you can, unique reconstruction is possible, and on top of it, come up with high rate coding schemes that make strings uniquely reconstructable under the given scheme you have readout scheme you have. So let's start with one of these uh, readout mechanisms, the most famous one, uh, shotgun sequencing. So this will be the topic that I, uh, on which I focus on substrings, and then after that I will talk more about nanopores and mass spectrometry readouts. So substrings, as before, just recall we work with binary data, we say that an L substring is uniquely reconstructable, if no two words share the same uh, L profile. And the basic problems um, that you can ask or the basic combinatorial questions or coding theory questions that you can ask are, what is the smallest length of a substring that would allow you for reconstructing either all or almost all uh, strings uniquely, as long as they have length L? How many strings really share the same profile as the string X? Or how many different profiles are there? So 
the number of strings that have the same profile as axis T denoted by Tx, and the number of different profiles for a given length L of a substring is denoted by NL. And so this problem, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, was first uh, studied by Yukonen in 1992. And he was interested in that pattern matching in a completely different problem. And he gave a very straightforward but incredibly crucial observation that a string is L substring uniquely reconstructible if each L minus one substring occurs in, uh, uh, as a substring of the string at most once. And the reason why this is true, so basically if I give you all the L substrings, and I know that all the L minus one substrings occur at most once, you can use what is known as a De Bruyne graph. And on the De Bruyne graph vertices, you will put all the L minus one substrings, and then uh, the De Bruyne graph is constructed in such a way that you have a directed edge going from one state to another if the suffix of the um, uh, so, uh, origin is the prefix of the uh, sink. And it clearly, if every L minus one substring is unique, you know exactly which path you have to follow through the De Bruyne graph and you will get unique reconstruction. So uh, another famous computer scientist Sienna and his student in 1995 showed something also pretty interesting, uh, that unique reconstruction properties really depend on the period of a string. And a string has period T if Xi is equal to Xi plus T, where, uh, uh, and that has to be true for all I between one and N minus T. And unique reconstruction from the L substring, uh, L substrings is impossible if the period is less than or equal to L. Otherwise, you will have to have L uh, greater than or equal to n half, roughly n half. And that's horrible because that means your substrings have to be really long. And here is an example that shows that the period can really mess up your unique reconstruction. So this is a string that has period four because this uh, part of the string repeats itself here. So if I take all the four uh, length substrings, this is what I get, but guess what, that's the same as the four length substring spectra of this other string. So when you have period uh, strings that are periodic, you can take those strings and change the order of the periodic pieces and then still get the same substring uh, spectra, and that is what's causing problems. So basically you don't want to have strings uh, with small period. Uh, because if, uh, if you have, sorry, um, uh, if you have periodic strings, then clearly your length L has to be larger than the, um, uh, sorry, smaller than the period that for you to succeed. So uh, on, the, on a completely different front, and this was 1995, in 1981, a bunch of information theorists actually looked at the related problem. And this is something that Janusz Turner told me. I, probably wouldn't have known about this paper before. And uh, Janos mentioned to me that basically uh, people were looking at um, error exponents of Markov sources, and they ran into a similar question, basically uh, trying to find the number of strings that have the same uh, L2 profile as X. And they got a complicated expression. I'm not even going to bother to explain what these exponents are, but I can take it offline. And the bounds were a bit loose, but that didn't prevent our colleague and friend Wojtek Stankowski to go ahead and simplify these uh, uh, derivations. And he and his collaborator in 2015 addressed the related problem of finding the distinct L profiles or Markovian types when L is equal to two, and then motivated by a completely different application, which was DNA-based data storage, we showed that uh, we can extend Wojtek's uh, results for the case of uh, L greater than two, as long as L is a constant, and we got this expression for the number of distinct uh, substring profiles. And so this was for constant L, but then uh, the question that we really wanted to address is, how can we do coding so that unique reconstruction is possible? So if you go back to this result we had, this enumeration result, it says that if L is a constant, this is the number of distinct profiles you get. So if you take one string from each fam uh, class of profiles, you will get a code of this size. So this is easy, but it's not constructive. 
and it really holds only if L is a constant. So uh, what can we do better? And what if L is allowed to grow with N? What if L is not a constant? And the reason why this is relevant is constant L is not uh, what uh, current readout technologies really provide you. It's impractical. Because what you have is that L can actually, uh, should be something that grows with N. And this is a question uh, of interest. What is the maximal size of a code when L is allowed to grow with N? And a very straightforward counting argument shows the following. If L is less than or equal to log N, the rate of the code will be zero. If uh, uh, L is greater than two log N, then you can have codes of rate one. And in between, uh, we didn't really know what's happening. And this was a result that one of my former students got, uh, Han Mao Kia, and it's based on something as straightforward as this upper bound that says that the number of L substring profiles is upper bounded by a binomial coefficient. And if you work with combinatorial entities a lot, you know that if I have L substrings of a string of length n, then I, will, uh, I can represent which substrings are present in that string. They're basically the number of substrings of each type by using a vector of length two to the L. And in each coordinate, I will add the number of substrings of length L that corresponds to that coordinate in terms of their multiplicity. And this is just counting the number of weak compositions. And basically, uh, we have N minus L plus two L, uh, choose two L minus one, because we know that we will have N minus L plus one substrings, uh, substrings of length L in a string of length N. So this is what basically gives you this bound, and this bound here is uh, due to a simple construction. So, and the proofs that uh, were provided for getting to code uh, rate one, uh, I mentioned that they can be made constructive, but they're basically um, using ideas from the Broin sequence, what are known partial as par partial to Broin sequences. So what we did instead is um, to come up with codes that are really easily constructed and, that are, uh, and to close the gap. Close the gap and show that you can actually have codes of uh, rate one as long as you are just above the log n threshold and you re need really little redundancy to achieve this. So if uh, you're a little bit above L is equal to two log n, let's say two bits, then you can have codes with one bit of redundancy and still be able to do really free construction. And if you go a bit above that length, then you can have codes with two bits of redundancy. And so the key idea is to shamelessly steal from the coding theory community and um, work on run length coding. And I think Marcelo here worked a lot on run length coding. And uh, just apply these ideas that were used for run length coding to repeat encoding. And here is how we do it. So the lesson we learned uh, just a second ago from Yukonen's work is that if each substring of length L minus one in a code string is unique, then the code string is L reconstructable. So that's what we need for the growing type of reconstruction. And uh, I won't go over this because of uh, time concerns, uh, constraints, but uh, Basically, this is the explanation of how the De Bruyne graph construction will work as long as we know that the string is L minus one uh, substring unique. So how do we actually then take this idea that if we have no repeats of substrings of length L minus one and transform an information string into a coded string that does not have any L minus one substring repeats? So you could take De Bruyne sequences of strings uh, and you can work with them directly, but they operate exactly at the log n, l is equal to log n point, and they, you will get for that point rate one half. You can try to use lempel ziv coding, and I talked about this with Wojtek quite a lot, but that's not going to help, and I can take this offline as well. And what will help is basically, as I mentioned, looking at what people did for run length coding, 
and uh, looking at people that knew a lot about Brownlee coding, uh, such as uh, Kisho Hammer Imink, who, who was one of the biggest names in coding for uh, magnetic and optical recording. So he and uh, Adrian, I think it was his student, a former student at that time, they uh, came up with a very straightforward scheme that allows them to uh, construct maximum uh, run length limited codes, codes based on a straightforward technique called run length replacement. Uh, some of you may still remember this technique and may have used it. And what we want to do is we want to adapt their scheme to be able to do what we call repeat replacement, to get rid of repeats of length L minus one. So what uh, Weingarten and Imming proposed was really to remove sh uh, short run, uh, or remove long run lengths and replace them with metadata. So what we are going to do instead is remove short repeated substrings, uh, substrings and insert metadata that allows us to retrieve the original uh, string. So how does run length replacement work? And if you see this, you will understand how um, repeat replacement works. So if this is an information string and we want to have a maximum run length constraint of five, uh, we will look for run lengths of length one larger than the maximum. So if we start with the given string, we first append a one uh, to the string to basically not be able to extend any run lengths of zeros. So this works for run lengths of zeros. And then uh, from the left, we start scanning the string and whenever we see a run length longer than one than uh, one plus the max, we will remove that run length. And again, just to make sure you notice, we are working with run lengths of zeros. And then all we need to do is append to the suffix of this string um, a binary encoding which tells you where was the location of a run length you removed. And that's the metadata we have. So in our case, since we removed a run length at position zero, we will add four zeros at the end of the string to encode that location, and then we will append one zero to indicate that whatever precedes this one zero is going to encode the location of a, of a run length of length r max plus, r, r max plus one. So this is what uh, uh, Weingarten and Imming proposed, and as long um, as n is less than or equal to uh, 2k minus one plus k plus one, then this scheme will have exactly one redundant bit and allow you to uh, do run length coding for zeros. So with repeat replacement, uh, things can, uh, you can try doing the same thing. You start scanning the sequence from the left and you check for repeats uh, of substrings of length uh, L minus one. And I hope this is six, it's actually, uh, the number is off, sorry. So you, you look at the uh, substrings of length L minus one, and you see if you see a repeat of this string. And what you do now is you would have to append, you would have to figure out where the repeat happened, remove it, and then append the two locations where you saw the same sequence appear, or sub, uh, substring appear, and then you do the same trick with appending a one zero to indicate that these are, this is metadata. But there is a big problem in this case because uh, when I do this replacement strategy, if I remove a repeat, I may create new repeats. You don't have that when you do uh, run length coding because when I remove a run length of zeros, I'm not creating a new run length of zeros. Here, I may create new repeats and it's not clear at all that this procedure will stop and that you will actually get the right redundancy. So uh, the, the point is that you have to have a specialized procedure that will ensure that in each round, the length of the input string will be reduced by exactly one. And then you will know when to terminate because once you reach the length L minus one, you know that you have only one string. And that's the uh, 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 shortest that you can make the string for because you're trying to make every L minus one substring unique. So this is very technical to analyze. I won't uh, discuss it in more detail, but uh, an, ISI, an IT paper is um, uh, currently under submission or already revised, I guess. So this technique would work well if you have L to, uh, greater than or equal to two log N. It gets much more tricky if L is between log N and two log N. 
And the reason is that if we want to have a constant redundancy, we cannot afford encoding two positions for the two repeats. So the position where the repeat appeared for the first time and the second time. So to mitigate this problem, uh, we want to only encode the position of the original repeat, but then in order to indicate where the uh, second repeat was, you need to use markers. And the markers will have much shorter lengths, something like log log n, and they will appear in the positions of the repeats and their length will tell you which repeat was it. But uh, in this case, if we want to use specialized markers, we need to make sure that these markers don't appear in the encoded string and confuse you. So basically, the markers can be runs of zeros, and then we do run length coding similar to what Weingarten and Imming did to remove uh, runs of zeros of this length, and then we use these runs of zeros to indicate positions where the repeats were basically removed from. And so this is an idea that you can find in uh, much more detail described in the uh, paper that I mentioned. What is uh, more interesting is you can uh, combine this unique reconstruction coding approach with additional techniques that allow you to deal with errors in the strings and missing substrings. And uh, what it leads to is looking at the code words that have substrings at certain handing distance from each other. And again, this is uh, something pretty complicated to discuss in the talk, but you can uh, look up the paper and see the technical details, which were not behind it. So the reading for this part of the talk is um, this work by uh, Han Malkia, uh, Gregory Pullian, and myself that started in the 16th, and then this uh, unique reconstruction of coded strings, 2018 paper, which is also an ar archive paper preprint, and uh, this one is an IP paper from 2015. So this was uh, about reconstruction from substrings. Now, if you have time, we could discuss potentially reconstruction from subsequences and uh, substring compositions. So let me start with at least explaining how people have approached these problems before, introduce the K-deck and the trace reconstruction problem. And let me recall uh, what the K-deck problem is all about. So you have a string of length n again, binary string. And um, the K-deck of this binary string is the set of all subsequences of x of fixed length k, okay? So subsequences means I can take non-consecutive positions. And the length is fixed to be k. So the K-deck problem asks to determine the smallest value of k, and it's usually denoted by f of n in the community, that is necessary to uniquely reconstruct any x, any binary vector of length n. And this problem has, again, a very long history that has nothing to do with uh, um, string reconstruction for molecular storage. It was actually a very pretty mathematical problem that a Russian mathematician, Kalashnik, introduced in the 70s. And then a lot of interest for this problem came up in the 90s when uh, the first lower bound was uh, 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 proven and derived by Krasikov and Roditi, and then Schulman uh, and Dudik worked and improved uh, this lower bound. And my personal favorite is, is this beautiful paper by Scott from 2011, which provided an upper bound. So uh, if you look at these two bounds, basically, what these bounds say that roughly square root of n uh, is the length of k or, or the sub, uh, subsequence length that will allow us to do unique reconstruction. And Scott's paper is beautiful because it uses arguments akin to those that we always hope will work in constructing extensions of our shamo tenegold's codes for uh, two and three deletions. And he cleverly used those moments i squared xi summed up that we see in deletion correction quite often to come up with this bound. So I really warmly recommend checking this paper out. It's very short and it's very beautiful. So, Is it um, also constructed, like uh, computationally? Uh, not really. <laughs> it's just a nice counting argument. But it's a very pretty paper. I, I, I'm very partial to this one because it's so simple and so uh, obvious in terms of uh, what he's trying to do, but we have to come up with this idea. Uh, 
This is uh, one question that I will probably not talk much about in the coded domain because it's very complicated. But it's also something that is not as uh, realistic when dealing with nanopores because we have that fixed length K requirement. Much more realistic is the following problem that has gained a lot of attention uh, recently. It's called the trace reconstruction problem. So uh, assume that you have a string X again, binary string of length N, and you're given a collection of M random subsequences or traces each one of which is obtained by uh, up, uh, applying an II deletion process where each coordinate is deleted with probability Q from the original string. And assuming that you have M such strings available, can you uniquely reconstruct the original string? And uh, the problem of interest is basically to determine all achievable pairs of M and Q. So given a certain deletion probability, how many traces do I need to be able to reconstruct the sequence uh, uniquely? And this question was first introduced by Batu and uh, collaborators in 2004, and their results, uh, since it was the first paper to talk about this, and the motivation was from phylogenetic tree reconstruction, uh, for random or average case uh, reconstruction, or for random strings, uh, what Batu and all showed is that if Q scales is 1 over log n, so it's something that uh, uh, is proportional to 1 over log n, and m is roughly log n, then you can uh, do random or average string reconstruction. It's possible, but uh, when I mention this reconstruction is possible, I really always mean with very high probability. There is a probability hidden in here. But what is really exciting is that just last year, uh, Holden et al. showed that you can improve this result significantly. You can actually get this result to hold for any constant deletion probability that is less than one half and with exponential uh, of the order of log one over three n uh, traces. And this was a beautiful result which was matched also for the case of worst case or arbitrary strings. Uh, Batu again had a slightly, uh, not slightly, but significantly weaker result, but Yuval Perez and they and all managed to show that for the worst case, you need exponentially O and one, uh, one to the third, and Q is allowed to be anything less than one half traces in order to reconstruct the string. So this is average case, or worst case, random strings, arbitrary strings. These are the results. And just very recently, Zachary Chase improved and came up with uh, in very nice results uh, with respect to lower bounds for trace reconstruction. Uh, he emailed us maybe just a few weeks ago. And uh, the best bounds we have are of the order of n to the three halves and log uh, five n for the average case. So as you can tell, worst case is clearly much more uh, complicated than the average case. Again, cannot emphasize how nice these papers are. So if you have seen or not seen uh, Nazarov and Perez's paper, which is almost identical in terms of approach to they at all, please take a look at it because it's a very beautiful application of complex analysis in addressing these questions, which is not something you would expect when you see the problem in, uh, in the first place. So what I want to talk about is uh, how do these uh, proofs and algorithms really work? Maybe for the sake of time, I'll skip this. Um, and just uh, give you an outline of what is known about coded trace reconstruction. And coded trace reconstruction, when you start digging through the literature, you will see that Löwenstein in the 90s talked about uh, coded trace reconstruction. But his question was different. What he said is, what if we take a code word of a deletion correcting code and we pass it through the deletion channel uh, multiple times, so we basically get the traces, can we use this de deletion correct uh, correction capability of the code to come up with the consensus sequence? So he immediately started with the specialized deletion correcting code. And then my friend and colleague, uh, Lara Dolacek and her group took up this idea from Leuvenstein and in 2016, they did some counting arguments that show if you use a L minus one insertion deletion correcting code, 
what is the number of traces you need to um, uh, reconstruct that code word. But uh, this is not exactly solving the problem of coded trace reconstruction because you start with the deletion correcting code. And it's not appropriate to use the deletion correcting code for the simple reason that I have multiple evidence for that string available through the traces. So maybe using a highly restricted deletion correcting code for each string is wasteful. So one thing we realized is when we were implementing our system that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, uh, in 2016, we had a heuristic that showed that string balancing helps in terms of reducing the number of uh, traces needed for reconstruction. And it was a heuristic argument. We use string balancing because it's easier to synthesize balanced strings. But what happened is that the student that was trying to make sense of the nanopore data we got realized that if we balance um, the number of ATGCs in every block of length 12, we could use the fact that we have to have roughly 50, um, exactly 50% 50 GCs and 50% ATs to find which symbols were deleted in which traces. And then there would be multiple passes through the strings to figure out how to get the balance correct, uh, corrected and combine the information from the M substrings. And at that time, we really had no proof that this would work. We just knew that introducing balancing should help somehow, and we had a heuristic algorithm. But then uh, we teamed up with uh, two smart people uh, Mati Chirachi and his student Ribeiro, who were also very excited about the trace reconstruction problem. And then we started thinking about how can we make these ideas we saw heuristically work with nanopore data uh, work in, uh, theoretically as well. And one of the results that we got, and it's very, I'm very excited about is it shows that you can really, in the worst case, go down and use only pol polynomial in log n traces and have codes that have negligible redundancy as n goes to zero. Admittedly, n over log n is not the best we would like to see, but it, still the codes will have asymptotically rate one. And we only need polynomial in log n traces in order to reconstruct the whole code book, worst case. And so how does this work? Uh, we started with the idea of balancing blocks. And uh, we had to be very careful with the length we choose. We took blocks of length log squared n, and then we interspersed them with markers, similar to what we did in the in other lines of work. And the markers were of log, uh, length, length log n. And this worked uh, well in so far that we could reduce the number of traces needed for the uncoded um, co uh, case, but it wasn't the reduction that we were quite uh, hoping to get. So then we said, okay, maybe we can repeat this uh, marker idea that pretty much everyone has been using, but in a smarter way uh, so that we do a nested construction. So we would use balanced blocks and markers where every sub block is uh, a, co a collection of other sub blocks. And that allowed us to further reduce the exponent to log log two thirds of n. But then the real breakthrough came when these two gentlemen joined the theoretical computer scientists, what we showed them looked uh, very much like something they've seen before in theoretical computer science. It's uh, the notion of almost k-wise independent random vectors. So I will not go over this. It's just interesting to see that there are some theoretical computer science ideas floating around. These almost k-wise independent random vectors uh, are vectors, binary vectors, such that if you take any k indices and you look at how uh, much the probability of these k uh, uh, variables being equal to a specific realization differs from two, uh, one half to the k, if that is bounded by some epsilon, and this is why we say epsilon almost k-wise, then these vectors behave almost like I, uh, vectors with IID components. What is exciting is that Noga Alon and his collaborators had nice uh, uh, existential results and proofs for, for the existence of these uh, almost uh, epsilon almost k-wise independent sets. And they showed there exist functions that will produce these uh, almost epsilon almost k-wise independent sets. 
And that is what allowed us basically to prove the uh, strongest result that we claim here that with this redundancy and only polynomial, uh, polynomial in log n traces will allow you to come up with uh, a scheme that accommodates any constant deletion probability that is not quite one half but sufficiently small. So this is uh, where I would probably stop. We started a bit late, uh, but I'm over time as well. Yes, please. Oh, you just mentioned worst case for the first result. What mm -hmm. is the worst case over, like the set of traces that you can get? Oh, the whole code book. So what, uh, what is the worst case for the whole code book, oh. for all the words that you constructed this way, right? So you can, um, let me just skip, I'll show you the references. As usual, I prepare many more slides than time allows, but uh, Coded Trace Reconstruction is a paper we posted online uh, in 2019. And then you can also look at the paper that combines the KDEC problem with trace reconstruction uh, from 2017 and 2018. So what I don't have time to discuss is substring compositions because we are way over time, but uh, I know I have a meeting with Saki's group, so this is exciting work which uh, really brings in Catalan paths and Catalan-like paths in a very unexpected way, and it allows you to use Catalan paths, something you most of you probably heard about before, to construct codes that um, you can uniquely decode based on the masses or substring compositions. So, but I'll leave that for offline. And okay, so those who want to join that group, I mean, here. Yeah, exactly. Are, are welcome to. So this one, uh, right, the, this so one. So 2.30. 2.30, okay. And uh, this one we're uh, implementing for polymer-based data storage because uh, here we have a lot of room to play with and the construction is so simple, you couldn't believe that it's actually that simple because it seemed like a nightmarishly difficult problem, but I'll, I'll talk about that offline. So um, just a few questions that I would really like people to think about is, uh, coded KDEC reconstruction, very difficult. Any ideas in this area would be great to hear about. Uh, trace reconstruction is interesting, even the coded trace reconstruction, but when it comes to uh, real applications and nanopore sequencing, let me tell you, the deletions are context dependent. It's not an IID deletion channel model. And I can take that offline as well. So we are really looking for more ideas in this domain. And then I'm not very happy with the formulation for the MSMS reconstruction problem. We had this formulation because it seemed tractable analytically. Now that we figured out it's not as hard to construct codes for this formulation, we would like to have something that looks more realistic. So with all that, sorry for taking too much time and I'll stop here. Thank you.